Hi, we're so glad that you found this Peak City message today. Our prayer is that during our time together that you would discover Jesus and be encouraged to follow him fearlessly. So good, man. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Happy Father's Day to my dad, George. I know you're watching all the way from Kentucky. Happy Father's Day to you. Love you. And uh, man, I'm excited for today. If you got a Bible and you want to get there, 2 Samuel chapter 18, we kicking it old school. I'm bringing you an old school message of war and battle and strength on Father's Day. A couple announcements before we jump in. Uh, if you're a young adult, we got young adult night happening this Friday night at 6.30. Great chance for you to connect with other young adults. Visit the website, our events page to learn where that is. Great chance for you to make uh, this church start to feel like home and start to make some good connections there. I uh, also want to continue to uh, make sure that we all keep talking about and keep knowing about our ministry called See the Need. Uh, See the Need is a great, great ministry in our church we started a few years ago where we literally just empower you to see needs around you, see needs in the community, needs in the neighborhood, needs in our city, and then hop on this website and let us know about it, and then we get to partner with you in uh, making some of those needs uh, get met, dreams become reality, and and it's so cool. Like This is one of my favorite ministries of our church because part of our generosity um, every single week goes towards meeting physical, tangible needs, And, and we actually have a lot of people submitting needs right now. And so uh, that's a beautiful thing. I think we need to keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, Just in the past month and a half or so, we've helped pay for rent for some people who are struggling. We've provided groceries. Uh, We're getting ready to help a single mom uh, get a car so that she can stop taking the bus to work and just have an easier situation there. And so God is using our resources for incredible, incredible work. And I think we should celebrate that, man. I think it's good to be a part of a place that's meeting physical, real needs. And it's attached to a church. It's like, man, we love you and we're meeting your need and you need to come be a part of this family, right? This is not just, hey, we want to you know, give you this check. We want to give you this check. And we, there's a family that loves you, that, w- that would love to, to partner with you in this life. So, man, keep, keep uh, doing that. Keep giving. Keep uh, submitting needs to that as well. And let's keep making a difference. All right. God's man must know this. God's man must know this. This is not my normal message, okay? Um, I, in fact, don't really like preaching messages like this on Father's Day because it's just too predictable, okay? When, when, when everyone's doing one thing, I'm like, nah, I'm out. Like, if you tell me there's a really good movie and everyone's watching it and it's like number one on Netflix, I'm going to give it like two years and I'm going to come around to it, right? So like, I just don't do this. Like on the holidays, I don't give you a message that you would expect because I think that's part of our job as, as the church is to, to um, startle people a little bit, kind of shake them up to, to, to an experience that they're not um, used to. And so like for me, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time now. So like my, um, my first Christmas here as, as pastor here, first time as a lead pastor period, uh, first time I was ever preaching Christmas, okay? I started on December 1st of 2019 at this church. And so three weeks later, we started our Christmas services and we were in a really, really small facility and we were packing it out. So we had six Christmas services, two each night for three days in a row. And so I was preaching, preaching, preaching. And I said, you know what? I'm not gonna preach the normal shepherds and wise men and little baby Jesus in a dirty barn manger. I ain't gonna do that. I'm going I'm to hit them with something they never expected, okay? So I thought I was this grandmaster pastor here. And uh, I said, I'm going to preach from John 8. And John 8 is where there's a woman caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus says, let, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? It's, it's this horrible situation. And, and he's in the dirt with this woman. And he forgives her and he restores her. And my, my whole, like, creative idea was I'm going to go, like, yeah, little baby Jesus was born in, in, a, in a horrible circumstance in, in the middle of a dirty barn to bring grace and love and forgiveness to your dirty, horrible circumstances. He can forgive me. I had this whole, like, preacher thing. What I didn't know, rookie pastor mistake, what I didn't realize is that I'm preaching on a woman caught in the act of adultery on Christmas, and um, children attend with their families on Christmas. <laughs> uh, the hatred emails flowed as all these parents started recounting, Petey, your sermon caused my children on Christmas Eve dinner to ask, Daddy, Mommy, what's adultery? <laughs> So, I've learned my lesson, and we're just going to preach a good Father's Day message today, okay? We're just going to play it safe. No, no. I really do believe it's very important for us to talk about what we're talking about today. Because I think when it comes to being a man, I think in this day and age, in this culture, it's really hard to know how to thread the needle. You're supposed to be strong, but not too strong. You're supposed to be soft and sensitive, but not too soft and sensitive. You're supposed to be involved, but don't helicopter. 
It's like, man, like it, it's, it's very hard to know what to do. And when you think about the caricatures of men that our culture is giving us, it's insane. I mean, you either have the picture of a man who's an idiot or a bully. I mean, this, this is what our culture thinks of when they think of, they, they think of Phil Dunphy and Peter Griffin and Homer Simpson, or you're the typical man who's just detached and removed and emotionally unavailable and doesn't really care and just kind of stoic and distant. They're, I mean, the, the caricatures are, are wild and it's, it's really hard to know how to be a man that is after God's heart. It's, it, it's, it's hard to know what does God really want from men. And, and, and I really do believe like we're not just talking to men today. We're not just talking to dads um, because the content of this message, ladies, you can absolutely apply it to your life. It's not just for men. Um, but here's the deal. Um, ladies, you really do need to understand what God is after in your man. Some of y'all ladies in the room, single ladies, um, as, as one of my elderly saints in the church put it to me one time, there's a lot of ladies out there and your picker's broken. Your picker's broken. You shouldn't be with him. What are you talking about? And you need to know what to look for in a man. You need to know the types of attributes and character traits that you should be attracted to because your picker's broken. You keep bringing the wrong, home, the, the wrong dude home every single holiday and, and God actually wants more for you. But, but some of y'all are already married and you're, you're already in it and I'm telling you, you need to know what to encourage your man and you need to know what to hold your man accountable in. You need to know the path that God has laid out for him in biblical manhood. And so I just want to preach a very simple message to you. God's man must know this, that if you're going to grow in the ways of God, if you're going to become the man that he wants you to be, you must know this because here's the deal. God is not confused. He is not fuzzy about what a good godly man looks like. There's very clear written. In, in fact, I would say that the passage that is our home base for this series, the garden of God, we've been talking about how God's garden is your soul. God wants to grow fruit in your life. He wants more for you than he wants from you. And, and we've used this one verse, Galatians chapter five, verse 22, if you would put it up, up, up there for me, Parker, it says, um, by the way, I'm, I'm a pause. I don't even care. I got, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I don't care. We're going to go. Y'all don't know this, but my man, Parker is the guy running slides for us today. Parker has been serving faithfully with his church for years. And this is his last Sunday doing slides for us. They're about to move to a new state, new assignment, all that whole deal. And I love Parker. This is our last rodeo, man. So let's celebrate Parker. <laughs> Parker and his wife, Brooke, expecting a baby soon. We love them to death. I knew probably like when I said, Parker, leave that up there. Like, who's Parker? That's Parker. <laughs> this is what God wants for your life. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Leave it up there for me for just a second. Can you imagine if the men in your life, the strong, fierce, courageous, hardworking men in your life were also full of Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can you imagine how different your family would be, how different your marriage would be, how different your, your parenting would be, how different our workplaces would be? And specifically today, I want to focus on these last two. Because as I was praying through this and, and thinking about Father's Day and thinking about what it really means to be a man, I think these are two fruits of God's spirit, two things that he wants to do in your life that actually really capture what it means to be God's man that you got to understand how to let God grow in you, gentleness and self-control. That if you really want to be God's man, you got to let him grow these two fruits of the spirit in your life. And you got to let him grow them in abundance, gentleness and self-control. All right. God's man must know this. Second Samuel 18. Are you ready to dig in? I know the ladies are ready. I get full permission for ladies to elbow. I normally say, don't elbow your husband. This is for you. You can elbow him today. It's all good. Second Samuel chapter 18. Let me give you the context before we jump right into it. We are, I mean, this is like, I'm setting you up to go watch Braveheart and Gladiator and cook some meat and be a dad with second Samuel 18. We're jumping into the middle of a war and it is King David at war against his own son, Absalom. Absalom is a son who has gone astray. He has betrayed the family. He's betrayed his father. When you read Absalom's story, he has done unspeakable things, things that should never be forgiven in the eyes of the world. And now he's, he's raised up an army to follow him, and he is fighting against his own dad for control of the kingdom. And that's where we jump in in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. It says this, David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent out his troops, a, a third under the command of Joab, 
a third under Joab's brother, Abishai, son of Zeruiah, and a third under Ittai the Gittite. Don't name your kids any of these things. I want you to remember Joab. That's the only name you need to remember from that list. Joab's the main, he's one of the main characters. I mean, what, what we're going to see in this passage is two men, David and Joab. You're going to see a man of the spirit, a man of God, and a man of the flesh. You're going to see a man who's letting God change his life. And you're going to see a man who's doing exactly what his selfish, sinful nature wants to have happen. It says, the king told the troops, King David says this, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you, David, are worth 10,000 of us. It'd be better now for you to just give us support from the city. Stay back, they're saying. And the king answered, I, I will do whatever seems best to you. And so the king stood beside the gate while all his men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. Can you see it? Can you see the fruit of self-control growing in King David. He sees his men going to battle and he wants to fight with them. Remember, this is David, the one who slayed Goliath. He ain't no chump. This is David, strong and mighty warrior David. He's ready to go. He, he doesn't want to be the king that sits in his castle and sends his men into battle and just watches them. He wants to be on the front lines with them. But isn't this so fascinating? His men, the ones he is leading, the ones who report to him, they say, this is not a wise thing to do. Isn't it such a godly attribute of a man to be able to listen to the wisdom of those that he leads? Isn't it such a godly attribute of a leader to be able to listen down and go, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong. The self-control. And then for him to sit there and to know, I'm sending men into battle, but the best thing for me is to stay back even though I'm a warrior, even though I'm a savage. And you see the restraint. He's strong, but he goes, no, 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 I've got self-control. And then we see the other fruit of the spirit in the, the thing he says right before they all leave. As they're marching out the city gates, look at the next fruit of God's spirit that comes up in him in verse five. It says, the king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, his three main commanders. It says he commands them, check this, be gentle. Woo! Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. Do you understand how wild and crazy that statement is? Absalom has done everything wrong. He has betrayed the family. He has gone astray. He's fighting against his own dad. Men have died because of this feud between the two. And David says, I know he's done everything wrong, and I know I should punish him, and I know everybody's mad at him, but I'm telling you, I want you to be gentle with him for my sake. <sighs> feel the wrath, I mean, come on, dad's in the room. You can feel it welling up in you, the anger and the rage and the frustration when your kids are doing things that are so stupid and, 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 and you feel like you're so disappointed in them. And, and David says, I know I feel all that, but I want you to be gentle with him. Oh, you can see the fruit of the spirit all over his life. You can see him teaching him how to be a father in this, in this very moment. Well, then we get in verse six and seven, what happens at a grand scale. We see this in verse six. It says, David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. And there Israel's troops were routed by David's men. And the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men, 20,000 men died that day, but David's men won the battle. Now we see in the next verse, what, that's the grand scale what happened. Now we see in the details what happened. And that's when Absalom makes his appearance. It says the battle spread out over the whole countryside and the force swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He had that Thor hair that looks good but serves no purpose. He was left hanging in midair, and while, while the mule he was riding kept on going. And when one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. And Joab said to the man who told him this, what? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? I, th th then I would have had to give you 10 shekels of silver and a, and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, hey, even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. 
In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai to protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And so if I'd put my life in jeopardy and nothing's hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. And Joab can't, can't control himself, doesn't have the fruits of God's spirit working him. Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and he plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And 10 of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. And then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, they threw him into a big pit in the forest and they piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Joab does what we all probably would have done in that situation. He sees the woman, come on, come on, this is not just the king's son that the king wants to have mercy on. This is the man who has caused thousands of his troops to die. I mean, Absalom has done unspeakably horrible things. And so Joab feels the anger. He feels the rage. He feels the judgment welling up in him. And he can't contain himself. He's got it. And so he just picks up the javelins and he kills him and takes care of it himself because that's what he deserves. You can see it. You can see the lack of restraint, the lack of self-control, the lack of gentleness. It's all, it's all over him. And what's, what's more is not only does he kill Absalom, he directly disobeys the king's orders, which he knows was wrong. Not only does that happen, um, he actually then sends a messenger to tell the king. He won't even go himself and say it. What a weak man who sins and can't own it, who does the wrong thing and can't even face up to his own mistakes. He sends a messenger in his stead. It says in verse, uh, we're pretty far down there now. Where are we at? Where's the next verse at? I need the number. Yeah, 32. I didn't have it in my notes. Thank you, Parker. I'm going to miss you, Parker. It says the king asked the Cushite. The Cushite is the messenger that was sent in Joab's stead. Is the young man Absalom safe? He doesn't care about the outcome of the war yet. He doesn't even want to hear the details. He wants to know about his son. His son. It says, the Cushite replied, may the enemies of my Lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. He thinks he's delivering good news of his death. And yet the news actually breaks his heart. It says the king was shaken and he went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's powerful. A, a, a young man who has sinned more and gone further than you could ever imagine and Yet King David still says, if only I had died instead of you. It's a, it's a great picture of God's man. And you see it here, two examples. You got a man after God's own heart, a man who's allowing God to work the fruits of the spirit out in his life in King David. And you've got a man who just does exactly what he feels like doing in the moment, who's following the works of the flesh, who's, 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 who's not listening to any guidance from God in Joab. And the question is, which man are you going to be? And I just came today to tell you that God's man must know some things. Okay, and these are all, I, I, I took this from my own journal. I hope it helps you. This is what God was teaching me in this. Okay, and I want you to write these down today um, to pray on them. I want you to see if God's spirit works in you, the same things he's working in me in this today. First one is this, God's man must know this. God's man must know that strength requires control. If you're gonna be God's man, yeah, 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 you gotta be strong. Let's, let's, let's like clear it up. A man should be able to defend his family. A man should be able to provide for his family. A man should be strong enough to work hard for his family. A man should be strong enough to make hard decisions under pressure. A man should be strong, absolutely. But God's man has strength under control. We keep hearing that phrase toxic masculinity in our culture, and no one really knows how to define it. I'll tell you how to define it. Toxic masculinity is strength out of control. It's when you can't subdue your own strength and you end up causing more damage. You trying to fix the situation and you actually end up causing more harm than good. Just the other night, um, my wife and I and our kids were sitting at dinner and we got this like, uh, kind of like funky uh, like, um, kitchen table. We got it at like some scratch and dent place. And, um, uh, and my wife really wants a, a new one because it's like we've scratched and dented it way more than it was scratched and dented. And so uh, I refuse to because children ruin everything. So we're, we're not getting a new kitchen table until they're graduated. That's the deal. I didn't make the rules. 
Those are the rules. Um, so we're sitting there at dinner, and in the, in, in the middle of our table, we've got this Lego centerpiece. You know, have, um, have you seen like the Lego flowers, Lego centerpieces? So my middle child, our youngest son, Solomon, uh, his gift to Brittany and Brittany's gift to him for Christmas last year was a Lego centerpiece. They love putting together Legos. And so we've got this Lego centerpiece there, and it's in the middle of the table, and inevitably someone hits it, and pieces fly off of it. And so I, you know, we're, we're at dinner, and someone hits it, and a piece flies off it. I say, hey, give it to me. I'll fix it. And Brittany's like, no, 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 you can't do this. I'm like, yes, I can. Give it to me. She's like, you have no mechanical feel. You're not good at these things. You should not do this. I've seen you try to put together Ikea furniture. It doesn't, we, we have to make another trip to Ikea to buy another one. It doesn't work well. I'm like, give it to me. And so I get in there and I'm like trying to fit these little Lego pieces. I don't fit my chubby little fingers into a little tiny hole. And so I'm like, finally, it's like, it just needs a little more, a little more strength. And oh, I shove it in there and it breaks like 15 pieces fall off. And Brittany's like, stop, just give it to me. You suck at these things. She's like, you're, you're like a bull in a china shop. It's a Lego. You got to be, you got to have strength under control. And she like in two minutes puts it all back together and it's, and it's perfect. I did more harm than good, man. Isn't that so often what we do as men when we come into a situation and we come in with strength? We're trying to fix it. We come in to discipline our kids and we, we're trying to fix them. We, we, we come into the workplace and we got, we got employees that aren't performing. We got, we got leaders that aren't doing the thing that we would do when we're, when, when we're not in the room. And we, we come in and we've got strength. You need to do it this way. You need to be like this. We come in strong. But come on, how many times have we seen it? Strength out of control does more harm than good. When you elevate your voice, when you, I mean, I can feel it in my gut when I'm mad. My teeth start clenching. Strength out of control, it does more harm than good. Every single time. I love how the writer of Proverbs says it. He says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Whoo, that's some wisdom from on high right here. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Let me translate that for you. Whatever area of your life you lack self-control in is the area that you are the most vulnerable in. If you lack self-control in the way you speak to your spouse, guess what? Your marriage is vulnerable. If you lack self-control in the way you discipline your children, your relationship with your kids is vulnerable. If you lack control in how much you drink, if you lack control in how much, in, 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 in the kinds of things you're looking at, if you, if you lack control in how late you're staying out with the friends you know you shouldn't stay out with, I'm telling you, your career and your calling are vulnerable. The things that you, the things we cherish the most, if you'll just do a quick self-inventory, what are the areas of my life that I am the most out of control? Those are the areas that the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Those are the areas that you are the most vulnerable. And you see it here. You see it, right? David, strength under control. Joab, and Joab's entire life, his entire career, his calling is now vulnerable because of what he has done. Because he could not rein in his strength. I just think there's some men right now in this room that need to hear this. And, and there's some women in the room right now who you need to lovingly support and encourage. And when you see your man express self-control, call it out in him. When you see your man fight back and go, no, 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 strength under control. Oh, encourage it in him. It's the sign of a godly man. God's man must know this. Strength requires control. The second thing I want to show you, I want to share with you. God's man must know this. God's man must know the power of a gentle response. God's man must know the power of a gentle response. Ooh, I knew when I got to this point that the room would be so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Because you know, think about this for a second. David, oh, he sees Absalom and He's thinking about Absalom. And even though he's done all these hard things and he's tried every way he can to try and maneuver and try to get Absalom to come back to him and try to win his heart and try to rebuild relationship. And, 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 and one of his last resorts is, hey, even though he's done all of this, would you just be gentle with him? Because David, God's man, he knew the power of a gentle response. He knew that when you've got it under control and you can just say a gentle, kind word, that, oh, it's got, it's got great power. How many of y'all walk your dogs in the neighborhood? Your dog walkers. You're the dog walker of your family. Okay, we got five dog walkers. I feel like the dog walkers don't like our church. I guess that's weird. <laughs> Big dog guy. I love dogs. We walk our dogs all the time. And uh, if, you, if you live in our neighborhood, I am so sorry. But I have no respect for you if your dog walks you. <laughs> 
You know what I'm saying? Like you've seen these guys that walk in their dogs and it's like, ah! I got mad respect. Like I know some dude is like Navy SEAL, CIA. Like he's something when he got a big dog with him and he's just like, shh, you. And the dog's like, like a gentle word from a dog owner and the dog listens. You're like, oh, that dude's a G. That dude knows what's up. That's a, that's a strong man right there. But isn't it funny? It, it's always the dogs that are not well behaved on their leashes. Their owners are always the loudest, aren't they? Heel, stop it. Ah! I only know because I am one of those dog owners. <laughs> Get over here. Are you done? But man, the power of a gentle, when you have the strength and people expect punishment and they expect harshness and they expect consequence, and you respond gently, oh, it's got such great power. The writer of Proverbs puts it like this, and again, this is just wisdom from on high for you. Proverbs 25, verse 15, it says, through patience a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bone. A gentle tongue can break a bone. You know a spirit of rebellion in your child? When they think they're gonna get the worst from you, a gentle tongue can break a spirit of rebellion. You know, when your spouse and you are at it and you're fighting like crazy, a gentle tongue, a gentle word, a word of forgiveness, a word of compassion, oh man, it can end the strife and bring you back together. Oh. And th Let me just ask you a, a more invasive question. When's the last time a harsh response fixed it? When's the last time a harsh response actually led your kids back into relationship with you? When's the last time a harsh response actually led your employees to follow you more? It's the power of a gentle response. It's the power of compassion. It's the power of forgiveness. And I ain't saying don't have discipline. I ain't saying don't have boundaries. I ain't saying, no, come on, man. So let me take a little side note on parenting. Some of y'all parents need to discipline your children. Some of y'all parents need to say, stop that. That's not good. It says raise a child up in the way they should go. Boundaries. And when they run up against the boundaries, there are consequences, absolutely. But the way you, even the way you deliver a consequence needs to be gentle. My wife, I, I'm preaching myself more than anybody. My wife will tell me all the time. I'll see her in the back of the room. My kids are acting up. And my teeth start gritting. My shoulders talk back. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh. And she's in the back of the room looking at me going, calm down. Gentle. I love you. I forgive you. It's all good. I'm going to give you a second chance. <laughs> But man, it's so funny because like when, when, I, when I look my son in the eye and I say, hey, you know you shouldn't have done that and you know the consequence, but today I'm just gonna be gracious to you and I know you're better than that. I'm gonna give you a second chance. It's all good, man, I love you. A gentle response actually wins his heart and changes the behavior. It's the power of a gentle response response. And David knew that one of the only chances he had to win back Absalom was at his absolute worst when he's rebelled the most. If he can just in that moment show a gentle, kind, forgiving spirit, then maybe, just maybe, Absalom might turn his heart back to the Father. You know, this is how God works. The Bible tells us that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his gentleness to us in our sin that actually leads us to want to follow him. It's not God's wrath. It's not God's punishment. It's not God's anger. It's not his vindictiveness. It is his kindness. It's the power of a gentle response, and God's man has to know it. If you're going to be God's man, you must know it. If you're, if you're a lady and you're dating a dude, watch how he responds when he's frustrated. Watch how he responds and see. God's man must know this. The last thing I want to share with you today. This one's going to hurt. God's man must know this. God's man must know that nothing matters more than relationship. And I know when I say that, some of y'all are cut to the core. I know when I say that, that some of you have broken, you have severed relationships with your own children. And you wish it wasn't that way, but it is. I, I know some of you have a broken relationship with your own father and your father has maybe passed away and you can't even fix it. It's, it's irreconcilable this side of eternity. I know, I know, I know. And, and I can't control that. I can't, I can't fix all, you can't fix all that. But what you can fix is the man that you are. What you can control is the response that you have. And I'm, I'm here today to tell you that God's man has to know this. Nothing matters more than relationship. Joab, I want you to see the difference. Joab. 
Joab didn't care about the relationship. What Joab cared about was how the soldiers viewed King David. When you read the story in its, in its full context, all, they cared, all, all Joab cared about was, this is going to look weak to your men. This is going to look weak to your army if you forgive him, if you have compassion on him. If you, if, if you let this go unpunished, you're going to lose respect. You're going to lose political image. You're going to lose kingdom clout. I'm telling you, it's going to be bad for your image. And David, God's man, says, ah, screw it. I don't care what they think of me. I don't care about what it does to my career. I don't care what it does to my leadership because God's man must know that nothing matters more than relationship. I want to speak specifically to the dads in the room or or maybe the dads to be, but everyone in the room can agree with this. Whether you've got a bad relationship with your dad or a good relationship with your dad, every single one of us were created. We were knit together at a soul level to receive approval, affirmation, and affection from our earthly father. You know how I know that? If you've got a bad dad and he's been, da- he's been bad for a long time and he's out of the picture now, why do you still get mad at him? Why didn't you just discard him like the rest? It's because at a soul level you were created, you were knit together at a soul level to receive approval, affirmation, and affection from your earthly father because it trains you, it trains your soul to receive the approval and affirmation and affection of your heavenly father. I'm telling you, we were created to be in relationship with our, our Father in heaven and, and our earthly Father. And, and like I said, you can't control all that, but your children, your children, they desperately long for the approval, affirmation, and affection of you. And you need to understand, because this relationship is so key, and I'm not saying anything about fathers are more important than mothers. Heck no, I'm not saying, no, no, no. I'm just telling you, because this relationship is so important, because it's so tricky, you've got to be careful. This is why Paul would tell us in Ephesians chapter 6, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What that means is that there is a great possibility, men, 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 we have to hear this. There's a great possibility for us to raise our kids and, and, and to parent in such a way that provokes our children to anger and causes them to want to break relationship and walk away. And we have to resist it at all costs because nothing matters more than relationship. On your deathbed, you won't care if they broke that rule in high school. On your deathbed, you won't care how much money they made. On on, on your your, your deathbed, you won't care if they made the sports team. If it costs you the relationship. I'm telling you, nothing matters more than relationship. And can I just say this to a dad in the room who feel like you've screwed it up? It's never too late to fix it. I, like, like you can't control what your dad does, you can't control how your children respond, but it is never too late to go to your child and even if you feel like they're 75% wrong and you're only, you only got 25% of the blame, it's never too late to go, hey, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you. It's never too late. It's never too late to fix it and nothing matters more than relationship. King David was willing to risk it all. I don't care if they, I don't care if my troops disrespect me. I just want my boy back. I just want my son back. He was willing to risk it all. And oh, come on, come on, come on. Go with me for just a second. If all the men in this room, I, part of me wants to say like the city and the nation and all, uh, we ain't got responsibility for all that. This room is what we're all responsible for. If all the men in this room came to this place where we said, you know what we're going to be? We're going to be God's men who have strength under control. We're going to be strong and we're going to have self-control. If all the men in this room say, you know what? I'm going to be God's man and I'm going to understand the power of a gentle response. I'm going to love my family and I'm going to be gentle even though I want to be frustrated. Oh, the, the power of a gentle response. If we all embraced it and if every man in this room embraced the reality that nothing matters more than relationship, that we need to be emotionally connected. We need to fight for relationships to stay close. Because as long as you've got relationship, God can do anything. If all the men in this room started living by that, can you imagine the change that our families would feel? Can you imagine the change that our city would feel, that our nation would feel? Can you imagine if the men in this room said, we're not going to be like the men of this world, we're going to be God's men? Oh, everything would change. And I know when I preach, I can see on some of y'all men's eyes, some of y'all are starting to lean in. You ready? 
Some of you are like, I'm ready, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. Somebody need me to open a jar of pickles? I'm going to fix it. Give me the jar. I got this thing. You're like, I'm a, I got it, PD. I got it. I'll take it from here. I'm going to be more self-controlled. I'm going to be more gentle. It sounds so stupid even saying it. <laughs> I'll fix it. I'll be more gentle. I got this, PD. I'm a white knuckle it. I just want to remind you, that's actually not what this passage that we've been reading in Galatians says. In Galatians, it says that the fruit of God's spirit at work in you is gentleness and self-control. You actually can't willpower your way to gentleness. You can't willpower your way to self-control. It is a natural outpouring of what happens when you follow Jesus. That Jesus at work in you can produce these things. Because guys, the ultimate definition, the ultimate picture of masculinity, the ultimate picture of manhood is Jesus. It's Jesus. Oh, come on. Jesus was the one who had strength under control, right? Jesus is the one who, who, who was so strong and he knew when to unleash it. Jesus walks into the temple and he sees it's turned into a marketplace, a den of thieves. And what's he do? Turn the tables over. Grab the whip. Start raising hell. Because it was, he knew strength needed to be unleashed. And he knew when strength needed to be subdued. As he stretched his arms out and he went to the cross. He stretched his... Like a, like, a, like a silent lamb, like a sheep being led to the slaughter. I, I could end this right now, but I'm going to subdue my strength and have self-control. And I'm going to do exactly what I'm supposed to do, which is die so that you and I could be forgiven. Oh, Jesus had strength under control. Jesus, Jesus, he embodied the power of a gentle response. When the disciples abandoned him at the cross... When they gave up on him, when they ran away like cowards, and he could have been mad and he could have punished them, what was his response? Forgiveness and grace. I know you were scared. I know. But now you see. Let's keep going together. Let's keep building the kingdom. He, he reinstalled them into ministry. He never gave up on them. Oh, he knew the power of a gentle response. And let me tell you, if you ever doubted it, Jesus knows at his core that nothing matters more than relationship with you. It was his heartbeat, it was his life that nothing would keep him away from relationship with you. There's nothing you could do that would ever make him stop loving you. He's never going to stop pursuing you. He's been pursuing you every day of your life and he'll keep pursuing you. you I'm telling you, you could not screw up bad enough that would ever stop God from pursuing you. Nothing matters more to him than relationship. I love, I love, I love, I love how we see Jesus in this story. Because when you look at that very last verse we read, 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 33. When David finds out about the death of his son Absalom, oh, this is where you're about to see Jesus. He says, oh, my, he's weeping. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. If only I had died instead of you, friend, Jesus said, I will die instead of you. I will stretch out my arms. The punishment you deserve for your sin, I'll take it. The death you deserve for everything you've done, I'll take it. I will die in your place. Your heavenly father put on flesh and bone and he went to the cross to die the death that we should have died because nothing matters more to him than relationship. If you want to be God's man, you can't do it on your own. You got to start following Jesus. You got to start trusting him with your life. I love how Paul writes it in Romans chapter five. Would you stand with me as we receive this last verse? He says, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But here it is. Here's the good news that someone needs to receive today. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you'll make the decision to start following Jesus, I'm telling you, you can become the man he's always created you to be. And I want to give you the chance to do that today. I, for some of you that have been following Jesus for a long time, but you know you've not been his man lately, you've not been God's man, you've been a man of this world, I want to give you the chance just to raise your hand and recommit to being God's man today. But either way, let's enter into a time of decision and response. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're new to our church, we do this every week. 
we never want the message of Jesus preached and not give you a chance to respond. And so if you're here and you would not consider yourself a follower of Jesus up to this point, but you know he's speaking to you. You know he's the one you've always been searching for. And you don't have to have the Bible memorized. No, 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 no. You don't have to have your life cleaned up. You don't have to have all the answers. You just got to be ready to say yes to the unconditional love of Jesus and yes to beginning your journey of following him. And if that's the decision you want to make today, to start following Jesus, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. We're not going to parade your decision around. We're not going to have anybody open their eyes, none of that. This is between you and God. If you want to start following Jesus, raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. We see your hand in the back. That's so good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to know if you just made that decision, all of eternity is is changed for you. Your life can go in a completely different direction now because you've said yes to Jesus. You are forgiven. You are free. His spirit is in you and he wants to lead you to become God's man. And all of heaven is celebrating. Pixie, keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, but can we honor and celebrate the decisions that were just made in the room? Thank you, Jesus. We're excited for you. We're ready to help you in your journey when you're ready to be known. For the rest of us, if you want to become God's man, if you you know you've been slacking, you know you've been off, off course, and it's time for you to step back into the man God's called you to be. Man, I want you to be vulnerable enough in, the, in this moment to declare that to God. If you, want to, if you want to recommit your life to Jesus and recommit to being God's man today, I want you to raise your hand right now. Hands up all over the room. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray for these men right now. Lord, you know every hand that was raised. You know every situation. And God, we ask that you would, through the power of your spirit, that you would help these men step into the calling that you have on their life. God, we pray that marriages would be changed, that families would be blessed, that our community would be so blessed by these men stepping up into the men you've created them to be. And God, we, we commit to being a church that's going to encourage these men. We're going to encourage them to become all that you want them to be. When we see it going good, God, we want to speak life into them. And so help us to be that kind of community for one another. And Jesus, I pray right now for everyone who's going through issues of pain with their own father, issues of pain with their own children. I pray that your spirit of comfort and peace would just wash over them right now. That you would change their minds and their hearts. You help them to see that if they're not dead, you're not done that anything is possible. And so God, we pray for restored and reconciled relationships in this house today. And God, we thank you for your spirit. Thank you for what you're doing in this place. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate life change happening in the room. Thank you for joining us for this Peak City message today. We're so glad that you were here. If you'd like more information on Peak City Church or information on how to give to the mission here in Colorado Springs, you can visit us at peakcityco.com.